and when he arrived, uh, there was a lot of press there and things like that. And when they got him in, uh, the famous comment was uh, to them, what were you doing out in the boat? He said, I was fishing. <laughs> Except the media weren't laughing. The headline writers couldn't see the funny side of those in Pearl in the Sea, and they fired into the players in general, and Jimmy Johnson in particular. Willie Ormond was also slated for letting his team have a night on the town, to say nothing of the ocean, immediately before such a big game. The Firth of Clyde and a self-righteous Scottish press were a bad enough combination, but now there was an England team with a point to prove. Wounded by their World Cup exit, the three lions on the white shirt came to Hamden growling and menacingly desperate for Scottish blood. But see that Scottish team? It really was a mistake to wind them up. And Shelton had to be so quick! Jordan! Yes! one now to Scotland! Johnston. Play to Larimer. Failed for hands. It's right through! At the end of the game, the sports were still in there and we did a wee lappy on her. And we Jimmy always want us to go round to the, the press box and give everybody the wee sign because of the, the amount of abuse he had taken. Johnston signalled possibly to the press box, but certainly in the direction of, in that area, and Willie Orman looks up too. Was he saying be one by two or was he saying I don't know? But I think his best answer was how well he played, how well the team had played and we got a sort of a, a great victory on the day. So it was a good result for us and it was a good result for Timmy, obviously. <laughs> the best way to prepare beating England, have a good night out on the Tuesday. The Scotland team's get it right up you to the press actually won the media over. Peace broke out when the entire World Cup squad was named as joint winners of the Scottish Football Writers Player of the Year Award. It was Scotland's summer of love and like all great summers, it deserved a cracking soundtrack. Instead, we get this. It's horrible. It's horrendous. I don't want to remember it. Then it's a nightmare. We were supposed to be going on top of the pops and everything, and it must have been the worst record in the world. It was shocking. Scotland would have to wait a further eight years for a class World Cup song. Although when we awoke with a fever in June 1974, the sky was still darkest blue. Willie Ormond assembled a squad which was full of confidence. Guys at the dawn of their careers and some at the dusk. The team captain was Billy Bremner of Leeds United and he brought his crew with him. Jimmy Johnson swapped the boat for the plane this time. Six foot two, eyes of blue, Big Jim Holton was a cult hero. Actually, whether they came from north or south of the border, all the squad were heroes to the fans. But Scotland were going into the big boys playground. In West Germany, for the greatest show on earth, the Scots were grouped with world champions Brazil, Yugoslavia, and what were perceived to be the group's whipping boys, Zaire. And then there was the Tartan army. Before then, they were just fans in tartan bonnets and scarves, but slowly they were gaining official recognition as a regiment. Their specialist manoeuvre? Having a good time. They were world class at it. Scotland tried to relax as they arrived in West Germany, but the birth of the tartan army coincided with the arrival of another baby for the Scottish game to handle. Commercialism. Television was the game's new paymaster. The world would be watching. It was early days, but football was beginning to catch on about its showbiz appeal. From this day forth, they decreed, wherever there are girls, there'll be girls. Aloha. By comparison with today, the 1974 World Cup was a get-rich slow scheme for the Scottish team. The Scottish press might have suggested that this was the start of a football Klondike, but when it came to making a few bob, the players couldn't even perform as stars in three stripes. Everybody was to get, uh, I think, something like uh, 750 to 1,000 pounds for wearing Adidas boots. We felt that we weren't, get, we weren't getting, uh, well, in many ways, our way, um, and enough for that particular uh, deal. Half the players wore Adidas anyway. So eventually what we did, and it was quite funny because uh, we cut all the markings off the boots and painted them black. So everybody was wearing black boots. 
everybody had to sit with a wee razor blade taking the Adidas stripes off their boots. I remember looking at the Brazilians, looking at us, looking at their boots and saying, what kind of make of boots is that, you know what I mean? Is that a new Scottish make? I wasn't interested in it, because I would have paid money to have been there. As nice as it would have been, it wasn't important. What was important, the fact that we were there with the chance to win the World Cup. And when the Strathclyde Police Pipe Band jumps out of a giant football, you just know the greatest show on earth has begun. Brazil had collected enough tokens to keep the old Jules Rimet trophy, and so the Scots were one of 16 teams playing for the new piece of jewellery. Scotland's first game was against Zaire, and in those days, African teams had no standing. In fact, some of our players probably didn't even know Zaire was in Africa. Manager Willie Ormond publicly acknowledged that scoring as many goals as possible would be the key to progress in the competition. Duh. Hopeful of having to use their fingers and toes to count the goals, the press and fans expected an avalanche. But as the team lined up, there was an unexpected nervousness on their faces. I can always mind the tension before the game. Even the Billy Bremner, he was always lively. It was quiet. Dennis Law, he'd seen it all and done it all. Quiet. There was a tension. A real tension. We had absolutely no, no idea tactically how they would play. We didn't know if any dossier had been done by the SFA. It was more what we were going to be doing. I didn't even know where Zaire was. They were a pub team, basically. They, they hadn't got a clue. It was very early years for the African teams, and they, they really didn't have a clue. But it wasn't as easy as we expected. It was difficult early stages in the game. But I felt once we got the first goal, we would go on and win it. Jordan... And it's a goal! Get It was a great relief as well, because I'll be, you think, yes, we'll beat them. You know, as the, as the minutes are ticking by and you've not scored, you think, come on, you, we need a goal, you know, and, and the more they were holding out, the more aggressive they were getting. The one thing I do remember at the game as a Zaire goalkeeper was hopeless, and maybe that's why Joe Jordan managed to score a goal. <laughs> and Jordan's there, and it's a goal! It was a perfect start. I think if the fixture had been different, maybe it would have been the last game or the second game, we maybe could have looked at it differently. But if you're winning your first game in a World Cup section, you're on a roll, you're, you've, you've done well. History had been made. Scotland's first ever victory at a World Cup finals. Joy of joys. Except, deep down, there was an uneasy feeling that somehow the team hadn't quite done enough. That they should have been more greedy for goals. Back home, the press were damn sure that they should have been. But it wouldn't matter as long as the brazil Yugoslavia match didn't end in a draw. It ended in a draw. Of course it did. But there was good news. The Scots were top of the section. The bad news arrived wearing yellow jerseys. Brazil, champions of the world. It was the game the nation had been waiting on. Thousands of Scots descended on Frankfurt for the highest profile match in the nation's history. I don't know what they thought about it as they sipped their caipirinhas in Rio, but over a half and a half pint back in Glasgow, they were right up for the cup. Right, we'll show you your bandits. You're going to be playing against somebody that really, really cares. Champions they may have been, but uh, we didn't feel in any way inferior. We expected to beat them. Except someone forgot to hand the Brazilians a copy of the script. I don't think it was a fantastic save. I think it was quite lucky, to be honest. I remember thinking how lucky we were to get away with it. And yes, in the first 20 minutes, they did have a lot of pressure. Both teams looking slightly apprehensive at this moment, and there's Willie Morgan getting his first touch of it. I think the first 20 minutes we found out that they're not as good as you think they are and, you know, we're doing really, really well. 